Hello and welcome to another episode of the V8 Supercars Fancast, the final episode of the 2018 season. And what a final round we had. It was every bit as exciting as I hoped it would be. Let's just get right into the race results. So first we've got the Saturday race. And boy, did a lot of things happen on Saturday. So jam-packed. Uh, if Saturday had been the last the last race, um, I think I still would have been happy. <laughs> because it was absolutely full of controversial decisions, uh, penalties, crashes, incidents, all sorts of things. So... Um, they line up at the grid. I believe it was Scott. No, it was Shane Van Gisbergen in first, followed by Jamie Winkup with Scott McLaughlin behind him. Absolutely key for Red Bull to get that front row lockout, which they did. Jamie Winkup at the last second managing to outqualify Scott McLaughlin by the smallest of margins, and they should be really happy that they did that because it gave them a huge strategic advantage over the shell cars. Remember at this point in the championship that they had 14 points separating them. That's only first and a third place. So if Shane came first and Scott came third, he'd be winning the championship. That's all that's in it at this stage. So everything matters. Strategy is important. They get away from the line and both Shane and Scott get a relatively poor start. Uh, Shane said afterwards that the white lines were to blame. They were a bit slipperier. Um, didn't really happen on a Sunday though, so maybe they cleared up over the over the weekend. Who knows? But long and the short of it is that Jamie's in front, Shane's behind, Fabian's in behind Shane, and then Scott after Fabian. Uh, of course, they end up switching around both the drivers, so Shane swaps with Jamie for the lead, and Scott swaps with Fabian for third place, as you would expect. And then we all sort of settled in for a bit. Uh, not a huge amount of interesting things happened, but then. <laughs> all at once, all at once. So Fabian Coulthard comes in for his pit stop fairly early um, in hopes of the undercut, which succeeds because Wink Up comes in after him um, five to ten laps later and comes out behind Fabian. And he was quite a ways up the road compared to Fabian when he pitted, so it worked out pretty well. Um, however, uh, Jamie being on the... Newer, fresher tyres had an incredible, well, not incredible, but he had much faster car pace coming out of the pits, and he quickly caught up to the back of Coulthard. So, he goes to try and overtake him into the last corner. He's side by side with him on the outside of the corner. Fabian has to take the narrower line. He breaks too hard, understeers, hits Jamie Winkup once into the corner and hits him again in the middle of the corner, putting Jamie into the tyre barrier, but not out of the race. He was able to back out of the tyre barrier and keep going on his own power. So there was no safety car, I don't think. Um, but it was a very close thing, and Jamie was very nearly out of that race altogether. Um, Fabian, amazingly, wasn't penalised for this. Um... I've watched it back a few times now, and to me, it's pretty clear that Fabian runs into him in the middle of the corner. He just understeers into him. He was ta- he was taking too much speed into the corner, and he just runs into the... S- he hits Wink Up just enough to unsettle him and put him into the wall. Um, to me, that's a pretty clear, straight-up penalty. I don't know why he wasn't penalized. Um... I mean, Shane was penalised the previous round for running into the back of Scott, which didn't upset his car at all. And Shane was penalised for five seconds for doing that. And I think a five-second penalty would probably be appropriate in this situation. But Fabian was given no penalty for such an incident, which I was pretty disappointed in. Um, I don't really see why there wasn't a penalty. It seemed pretty obvious to me that it wasn't a racing incident. I mean, it was a racing incident, but Fabian's pretty much at fault. Like, there's no way that Jamie was at fault for that. He was just there. <laughs> He's allowed to go around the outside of him on a corner. Um, but whatever you think of that situation, there was no penalty given because, and it's probably maybe just for the best of it, because Fabian Coulthard 
not very long later, crashes at the end of turn one into the tire barrier in spectacular way. Nick Perkat barely avoiding him, gets his entire right side of his car ripped off in the process. In a, in a crash I've never even seen before. I've never seen a car have their, their, their side ripped off like that. Um, it's quite fascinating to see, actually, what happens. Apparently ended up with a few bits and pieces in his lap from Coulthard's car as well. So that would have been a bit scary for him. But uh, Fabian was out again with another race. He crashed at Auckland. He's performed pretty poorly all season. He's had one win to his name this year. And this is to start, this will start a new, well, I want to start a, a conversation about this. Let me know in the comments what you think of Fabian Coulthard, because my opinion of him has been falling all season. He did good last year, but this season he's been nowhere compared to Scott. Absolutely nowhere. Scott's got, I think, nine wins this season. Yeah, he ended up with nine wins this season. And uh, Fabian had one. <laughs> that's, I mean, considering they're meant to be in the same car, that's a bit, that's pretty, lo- that's pretty woeful. And considering that Red Bull was sort of nowhere for the start of the year and it was all shell for a long time, again, Fabian ha- really has no excuse to not have done better this year. Um, I've been very disappointed with him, to be honest, this year. He really, really needs to do better next year. Um, or I would, if I was running that team, um, if I was running DJ Arpensky, I would think about replacing him with someone else because he's really not, he's really not performing to the standard that, that Scott is setting. He really isn't. Um, sometimes he doesn't even finish in the top 10 when Scott wins a race. And that's incredible. Um, I will say that the team has kind of neglected him strategy wise in terms of tires and fuel. They often bring him in quite early and go for the undercut. Um, which inevitably gets him overtaken again towards the end of the race because he's got no tire life left. Um, so maybe he would, he maybe it would benefit if they put him on a flatter strategy and didn't prioritize McLaughlin so hard. Um, but I think Fabian has been quite poor this year, to be honest. Uh, so let me know what you think, how Fabian's been doing. And uh, if you were to replace Fabian, who would you replace him with? Because that's an interesting question considering the performances we've had this year. There's been some great rookies throughout and I'd love to see someone get a chance in that sh- in that DJR car so Fabian crashes into the wall this brings out the safety car on lap 42 the critical lap projected critical lap where the cars could fill up with petrol and get home on one tank was lap 50 so the safety car comes out and of course everyone jumps into the pits and gets new tires and fuel to get home Uh, The problem is, is that the regulation amount of fuel that you need is 140 liters into the tank during the event. So during one whole day on the Saturday, at some point, 140 liters total needs to be put into the car. Um, This is a legal, this is a race requirement. It's a, it's a rule. It's how they do things. Um, Somehow, somehow, uh, DJ Arpensky managed to fill up Scott McLaughlin's car to the 140 litre limit when almost nobody else was ready for it. So it was a little too early and pretty much everyone was kind of fuel saving, taking it easy, um, making, ensuring they had enough fuel in hand so that the pit stop that they took under green flag would be slot, would be uh, shorter so that they wouldn't have to spend so much time filling up, um, which is standard. And they were expecting to not have to come in for another 10 or so laps. Uh, the safety car comes out and all of a sudden they have to fill up right now to maybe get home. And most cars, including the Red Bull cars, weren't able to hit this 140 limit in one pit stop. So both Shane and Jamie, I'm pretty sure, go out of the tr- onto the track again under yellow flag, come back in after one lap and fill up the remaining couple of liters left to fill into the tank before heading out again. Now this second pit stop is important well, first of all, this whole thing is important because it has allowed Scott to get in front. He was in third, now he's in first. It also has put Shane and Jamie back into the order. Shane, I believe, came out in eighth spot after this pit stop. It also triggered what would eventually be the Shane's downfall for the weekend. So in his second pit stop, he came in at a bit of an angle 
and they they raise him on the air jacks and put the fuel in. Unfortunately, and this was this is purely a pit crew error. Nobody else's fault except for the two guys who were putting fuel and using the jacks on his car. Those two pit crew members. Unfortunately, the guy with the jacks drops him before the guy with the fuel is ready to stop fueling him up. So he drops him off the jacks and there's still fuel going into the car. According to the rules, this is illegal. You can't drop a car before it's done fueling. If you do drop a car while it's being fueled, you need to prop it back up, then take the fuel out, then drop the car again. And they didn't do this. The car dropped, they took the fuel out, and Shane went. Uh, It went sort of unnoticed during the race because it was very quick. Um, It's only for about a split second or so. But it is obvious on on a playback that he is on the ground when they take the fuel back. No real question about it. And this awarded him a 25-second post-race penalty, which was applied after the race because they had a review of the incident over the night and didn't declare it, didn't declare their decision until the morning of the Sunday morning. So keep this 25-second uh, time penalty in mind as I go through the rest of the race. But as of in the actual race, no one no one knew this had happened yet, but keep it in mind. We're in the future. We know these things. Um, so, that's not the only thing that happened in the pits, though. More controversy than that, because Scott Pye comes in. He was quite high up after pitting very early. Um, seems to be a bit of a Walkinshaw Andretti hallmark at the moment to make James and Scott pit quite early, and then their tyres just last. They've been quite good at, it, at making up positions that way. Um, so Scott comes in and Craig Lowndes is right behind him. James Courtney is already in his pit bay and Scott has to park up behind him. And he does so in a way, he doesn't, the pit lane's too narrow for him to go in at an angle. So he parks next to the previous, the pit bay behind his own. And he parks next to the guys who, you know, have got the tires up and ready to go for the pit bay behind him. I think it's Tickford. I think Tickford is the pit bay behind them. So he parks up next to the Tickford guys and gives just enough space for everyone else to go through on his right because the pit lane's very narrow at this circuit. They tend to be at street circuits. Unfortunately, Craig Lowndes runs right into the back of Scott really hard. He goes up over the tire um, and he completely bends his steering. He said later that it was at a, at a t- more than, uh, I think it was a 45 degree angle difference or something like that um, to straight. So he has to have his wheel corrected by 45 degrees to, just to go on a straight line. Um, and he was furious with himself. They cut to, they cut, they simply, they just cut to Craig Lowndes swearing and punching the steering wheel. Absolutely absolutely livid with himself and for and with scott he gets out of the car and uh thankfully he doesn't say anything really mean about scott because i don't actually think it was really his fault nobody else ran into him he didn't cause a bottle he didn't cause a bottleneck um i think craig was just a bit too i think craig might have been a little impatient and he was very close behind him when scott did pull up um and there's not a lot of space but there is definitely enough space for everyone else to go through because he didn't no one else ran into him and no one else was held up by him. Um, so I think Scott did everything he could without taking out one of the guys in the pit base. Um, but unfortunately, Craig ran into the back of him. Not a great way for your second last race to go. Um, but he did get back out again eventually a couple laps down. So he did manage to finish the race at least. So that's something. And at least it wasn't his, ra- his last race either. Um, but it was definitely a shame to see um oh but that's not where it ends for the drama under this safety car because lee holdsworth um had a brilliant weekend i gotta say i think uh i was said some harsh things about him last time and i want to take those things back a little bit because he sort of proved me wrong which is nice to see i like it when people prove me wrong especially since it's his last drive at that team Um, he's being replaced by Mark Winterbottom, of course, if you didn't hear the news. Mark Winterbottom leaving after 13 years at Tickford slash Ford Performance Racing. He's moving on to a new team um, due to a lackluster performance um, at the Tickford 
team, which is fair enough, but it does make me wonder why he's going to Team 18 of all of all the cars on the field. They've been nowhere this year, and they never have been. Um, we'll see how that works out for him. Hopefully, he doesn't end up retiring at the back of the field because he is a good driver, and he deserves a good car. But we'll have to see how that goes next year anyway. For now, Lee Holdsworth ends up at the front of the pack after not pitting under safety car. So I believe he did pit before the safety car and they decided since they had under, I believe their pit crew made a mistake and they ended up overfueling him. They put about a hundred liters into his car. So he only had about 40 left um, to go. So he had a lot of fuel in hand and the safety car comes out not long after he comes out of the pits. So they decide sensibly to leave him out on the track. So now he's in first place with Scott behind him. Uh, I haven't been the biggest proponent of the supercars officials but for this event because the safety car goes in, the lights go out on the safety car, that means it's going in this lap, that means that when they come around the last corner, they can start racing again. That's how it works. That's how it's always worked. There's never been a problem with that. But for whatever reason, there was a miscommunication between the marshals who some of, not all of, but a large amount of them were still waving the yellow flags and had the safety car boards out as they came down the start straight. Now, if you've watched a lot of racing before, you know that they can take off down the start straight. That's how it works. You come around the last corner and you can take off generally. That's when you can you can head back up to racing speed. And some marshals were waving green flags. There's even one shot where there's a green flag being waved by a marshal in the same bay as a marshal waving a yellow flag and holding a safety car board. So something clearly went wrong in terms of communication there. Um, and some of them were holding, were waving yellows and some of them were waving greens. Although I would say that most of them were waving yellows. But as Lee Holdsworth takes off to go down the main straight, he seems to be the only one who decides that he's going at full speed. Um, Scott behind him continues weaving as though it's still a safety car lap. And as a result, Lee gets about four to five seconds ahead before everybody else starts speeding up. So... He takes advantage of an error and un, unsure drivers and an error on the marshals and takes off ahead of everybody else. I thought this was fine. It was a mistake, but Lee Holdsworth isn't exactly in the hunt for the championship. Um, so it's not like he really gained a huge advantage by doing so or ruined anybody else's race and that sort of thing. Um, and even if he did gain an advantage, it, it's not really his fault. The marshals were waving the wrong flags. Like... You can tell they're waving the wrong flags because they hurriedly change over to the green flags anyway. Like, But despite what I may think, the supercars officials deemed it necessary to give him a pit lane drive-through penalty for ignoring safe, uh, safety car restart procedure, which I thought was incredibly unfair. Um, it would have been confusing as a driver given the different flags being waved and the fact that safety car's not in front of you anymore. This, we don't have virtual safety cars and supercars. Um, you're behind a physical car or you're not. And if the car's gone in the pits, it's green lap. That's how it works. Um, Lee took the ben did the, the I think, the right thing. He did what I probably would have done as well, is where in the benefit of the doubt, well... There's a bunch of people behind me, and if I don't go and they do, then I've lost the lead. And if they get, if they don't get, who's to say that I'm not meant to go? I don't know. So I'm going to go now just to protect myself. And he gets one of the harshest penalties that you can get in this sport, which is a drive through penalty. Adds about 30 or 40 seconds to your race time. Um, I don't agree with this at all. I uh, really, really, really wish that they would own up to the fact that they had made a mistake this time. It wasn't the driver's fault. Lee Holdsworth had nothing to do with it. Um, and he didn't gain much of an advantage either. You could have given him a five-second penalty to nullify the advantage he got from speeding off. And that would have been it. And I would have been fine with that. Because um, he was the only person who left. Everybody else stayed at, under, safe, under yellow speeds. Um, but he was also in front. So anyone... Scott chose to go slowly, so everyone else chose to go slowly as well. Um, 
I don't like it. I don't like how harsh it was. And I don't like that they're punishing another driver for what is essentially their own mistake. Um, but... Yeah, I don't... Yeah. <laughs> I really I really don't have anything else to add to that. I think Lee Holdsworth was robbed there. He could have had a really good result. Um, he ended up finishing in 12th, which is, pro- I think, his best result of the season, if I'm not wrong. And... Uh, he could have done a lot better. He really could have. He would have been. He could have been in that top five, to be honest. He really could have. Um, he had a good chance, and he was basically robbed of it because of um, officials' mistakes, and then taking the what I think is the only course he could have really taken in that situation. Um, but what can you do? Anyway, moving on. Um, there wasn't much after that for a while. Um, Shane had to fight his way back up through the field, down from eighth, uh, which he does pretty well and fairly quickly. He gets stuck behind Simona for a while, um, which was good to see her driving really well, actually. Um, all the Nissans did fairly well on the Saturday and the Sunday. Um, but Shane eventually gets around everybody. And his next proponent is Scott. Well, no, it's not actually. <laughs> the next next couple of cars in front of him are Chaz Moster and Scott Pye, who were both theorized to have to pit again under uh, later in the race, whereas Shane and Scott and David, David Reynolds was behind Shane, um, would not need to pit again. So it was Scott McLaughlin in first, followed by... Scott Pye, Chaz Mostert, Shane Van Gisbergen, and David Reynolds. That was the order of the race. And then Chaz Mostert crashes in the same place that Fabian Coulter does, right on the exit of Turn 1 into the tie barrier. Uh, He doesn't crash hard hard enough that he's out of the race. He is able to drive off. But he did end the race five laps down after they had to repair that damage, Um, which is unfortunate for Mostert. He had... uh, He's driven the wheels off that Tickford car. He seems to be the only one who's been able to get it anywhere. Dragging that thing to a race win at the Gold Coast. He's been really impressive for him to uh, get that car to where where it is. Because it has no business being in the top 10. Um, Even if it has got a bit better towards the end of the year. It really had no business being anywhere near the top 10 this year. Um, So it's unfortunate for Mostert. Um, but that's the way it goes. That moves Shane up into third place. So now he's on the podium with Scott Pye ahead of him, who we, as we all suspected, eventually uh, peels into the pits to get a set of tires and more fuel to get to the end of the race. So then it's just Shane and Scott. And Shane's quite a, quite a ways behind Scott. I think it's like nine seconds or so. So Scott's got a safe lead in the bag. And we're all thinking, Scott McLaughlin's got this. <coughs> Meanwhile, Cameron Waters hits, uh, I believe it was uh, Will Davison in turn two. Very similar incident to um, what happened between Fabian Coulthard and Jamie Winkup. In that incident, Coulthard was on the inside and understeers into Winkup and puts him in the wall. In this incident, Waters is up on the inside of Davison. He over he out breaks himself a little bit, understeers into Davison, hits him. And Davison loses a few positions, but doesn't hit the wall or anything like that. And Cameron Waters is given a 15-second penalty for that incident. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing, that they wouldn't give Fabian any penalty for what is essentially the exact same incident with a worse outcome. And they gave Waters a 15-second penalty for what amounted to understeering into someone and not even crashing them, just pushing him off the circuit, and yeah, he lost a few positions, and that sucks, and yeah, I agree he should have been penalised, but like a 5 or 10 second penalty would have done, I don't think a 15 second penalty was justified, especially since Will Davison was able to continue racing, um, but the fact that they gave a penalty to Cameron for what is almost the exact same incident as um, what f- happened to Jamie and Fabian earlier in the race, and they didn't give any penalty to Fabian for that, is bonkers to me. How did that happen? How did they contradict themselves so quickly in one race? Um, To me, the incidents look exactly the same. 
feel free to disagree with me or tell me why they were different. I'd love to hear it because I honestly, I do want to have my, my mind changed. I want to have some faith in the officials that they know what they're doing. Um, but these this weekend was filled with what I thought was extremely questionable decisions. Um, normally, I don't have that much of a problem with their decision-making process. Yeah, they're not perfect, but this weekend was awful, especially Saturday. Um, very questionable decisions made all weekend. I couldn't believe what I was seeing sometimes, especially when it came to Holdsworth and Fabian this weekend. Um but anyway, we go into the dying phases of the race now. Scott's ahead of Shane, and now some questions are coming up about whether or not Scott McLaughlin has enough fuel to get to the end. So everyone is pretty in pretty massive cons- conservation mode. Um, they filled up before the critical lap to get home, so everyone's saving fuel, saving tires, um, making sure that they can just cross that finish line at the end. Um Greg Murphy, the pit lane reporter and former driver, of course, um, even asked Ryan Story, um, Scott's engineer, if he had enough fuel. And Ryan very confidently said yes. This was around lap 55 or so, so pretty early in. Um, The radios go all quiet until around lap 88, 90-ish. And then we start hearing a lot of very urgent calls um, from Ryan to Scott, telling him to save fuel, save fuel. You need to save fuel. So we know that Scott has to go into massive con- uh, uh, saving mode, and he does so. He does very well, doing things like you know, downshifting without blipping the throttle, upshifting before you've hit maximum revs, rolling off the accelerator into a corner before you brake, that sort of thing. Um, which he does, and they, they took a few on boards, and you can hear it. Um, he is saving quite a lot of fuel. Um, and then you cut back to Shane at the same time, who is saving fuel still, but not very much at all. He's going max rev limiter. He's rolling off a little bit, but not much. Um, he's not blipping on the downshift. So he's doing a little bit of fuel saving, but not a lot. Um, and then two laps before the end, lap 94, we hear on Shane's radio... Uh, at this point, Shane has closed up the gap to about three seconds, simply because Scott has been fuel saving so hard and he hasn't. Um, we hear over Shane's radio, you're all good for fuel, go get him. <laughs> at the same time, we hear on Scott's radio that he needs to fuel save massively or he might not make it to the end. And Shane puts in a monster drive. Um, he closes up the gap to um, half a, uh, one and a half seconds by the end of the by the start of the last lap and then in the first sector alone he closes the gap by one second which is an incredible incredible time delta i've never seen something so so vast in time differences before against two people racing in first and second but um he closes up the gap immediately and he ends up passing him just before the last corner just as scott runs out of fuel he does fortunately make it over the line on the fuel that he has but he doesn't make it around anywhere because he parks the car up against the wall at the end of pitch straight um shane finishes in first place followed by scott mclaughlin in a result that i never thought would happen i thought scott had it in the bag um followed by david reynolds in third jamie winkup in fourth scott pye in fifth um an incredibly exciting and action-packed race i couldn't believe what i was seeing for most of that race it was pretty amazing um and then and then remember shane's got a 25 second penalty coming to him on sunday morning he gets that 25 second penalty applied for an incorrect pit stop procedure not the first one that he's had um although this is the first one he's been penalized for that was controversial um which dropped him from first place to fifth place so this means that scott did win the race bringing his total wins up to nine. It also meant that had Shane won that race and Scott came second, the championship gap would be closed to two points. That meant that whoever finished ahead of the other driver would be the championship winner, no matter what. But instead, the gap got ballooned back out to, I think, 26. Um... 
I'm pretty sure it was 26 points, which meant that we didn't quite get the uh, heart-stopping race that I wanted for the last race, because, boy, that would have been exciting to see. What we did get instead, though, was that Shane had to finish the next race in first, and Scott had to finish in sixth or better. So if Shane finishes in first, Scott had to finish sixth or sixth? Sixth position or better, there we go, (laughs) to win the championship. He finished in seventh and Shane came first, he would lose the championship. That was what we went into the next race on. So, still some exciting set of rules. But before we go into the next race and talk about who the champion was, let's go over the results for the Saturday race. So first, it was Scott McLaughlin after that penalty was applied to Shane. Barely making it home, just rolled over the line, just eked over the line. Uh, David Reynolds in second, putting a very conservative, well-earned podium position, followed by Jamie Winkup, who probably really wasn't expecting to be suddenly on the podium, (laughs) Um, especially since he ran into a wall at the uh, start of the race. Good recovery from him to get back into the podium spots after an accident like that. Um, Uh, Yeah, Uh, Scott Pye in fourth. He did a really good job as well. He's very good at recovery drives, Scott Pye. Um, Shane in fifth after his penalty applied, unfortunately, making our championship less exciting to watch for the next day. But Red Bull should really get their pit crew together because it's not the first time they've had a a championship losing mistake like this this year. Um, Mark Winterbottom in sixth. Great drive from him. He started in 22nd, so that was an excellent effort. James Courtney in 7th, Andre Heimgartner up 18 spots from last on the grid to 8th position. Rick Kelly in ninth, Simona in 10th, which I think is her best result. Um, which is kind of sad, actually. It's sad to see the Nissans not really up there um, in their last uh, year as a factory team. Um, Anton Di Pasquale in 11th, the... Uh, yep, yeah, Anthony, yeah, yeah, Anthony Pasquale in 11th. Uh, Lee Holdsworth in 12th, which I also think is his best result, at least of the year, not of his career. Um, good result from him. He drove really well in that car. Um, seems like it had a little bit of pace, fortunately. And here's a name that I didn't expect to see in the top 15. Todd Hazelwood in the number 35 Big Mate Racing Holden Commodore for, I think, Matt Stone Racing. Um recently pulled up from the Super 2 Series, running a a Holden Commodore VF2, as opposed to everyone else's Holden Commodore ZB. Um, the only one not running the most recent version of the Holden Commodore, probably the reason why they don't have good pace. And I believe the reason why he finished well is because the Newcastle track is quite tight and twisty and doesn't really allow um, the drivers to get up to full speed. And I think... I think, I can speculate based on this result, that the car, the problem with that car is that it doesn't have good top speed. Um, so really good to see him get a good result. That's definitely the best one he's had. Uh, Cameron Waters in 14th, even after his 15-second penalty. Michael Caruso in 15th, Will Davison in 16th. Richie Stanaway in 17th in what could be his second last race for the team. I really don't want to see him go, but he really hasn't deserved another year either, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, Tim Slade in 18th, Jack LeBrock in 19th, James Golding in 20th, Chaz Mostert in 21st, Garth Tander in 22nd, Craig Lowndes in 23rd, and not classified, Nick Perkat, Fabian Coulthard, and Tim Blanchard, who did actually run into Coulthard after his crash as well. So that was the Saturday race. Let's go to the Sunday race. What happened in the Sunday race? Not a lot. (laughs) All eyes were on... um, Shane and Scott. And really, let's just get right down to it. David Reynolds finished in first. Scott McLaughlin in second. Jamie Winkup in third. And Shane Van Gisbergen in fourth. Yes, that does mean that Scott McLaughlin is the 2018 Supercars champion. Um, great job to Scott. I honestly think he was the driver that deserved it this year. Um... If I had to give it to one of the two based on merit, I would probably give it to Scott and especially DJR Penske. I think they did a better job all around this year. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, I think they did a better job all around this year, to be honest, um, especially since they didn't make some any of those silly pit stop mistakes like uh, 
Red Bull had been making in the last two rounds with that wheel incident at Auckland and the the fuel thing at on the Saturday. Had a Red Bull not made those mistakes, I think we might have seen a different race, um, a different a different championship outcome. Um, but I think that Scott and his team definitely deserve it this year. Uh, redemption for 2017, of course, where he pretty much ga- went into 2017 with a guaranteed victory and came out with a loss to Jamie Winkup. So it was nearly a repeat um, of the previous year. But he ran away with it. Um, and it was good to see Scott get a championship because he's definitely been good enough to get one for a while now. Um, great work from him. Great work from the team. Super happy for him. Let's see if he can get two in a row. That'd be good to see. Um, James Courtney in fifth. Andre Heimgartner in sixth. Chaz Moster in seventh. Garth Tander in eighth. Lee Holdsworth in the top ten in ninth. Uh, besting his previous best position of the year from the previous day. Scott Pye in tenth. Craig Lowndes in eleventh. His last full-time race. Um, him and Scott both did burnouts on the track afterwards, which was cool to see. Um, Craig, of course, will be back for Bathurst and Sandown and uh, the Gold Coast for the endurance races. But for now, he is gone as a full-time driver. The end of an era, I would say, for supercars, for sure. Nick Perka in 12th. Mark Winterbottom in 13th in his last race for the Ford outfit. After he goes to the team that Lee Holdsworth is currently at so hasn't had the best of years Mark Winterbottom has definitely been outclassed by Chaz but I think in terms of the Tickford lineup he has probably been second best ahead of Cameron Waters and definitely ahead of Richie Stanaway Um, speaking of Cameron Waters in he finished in 14th followed by Tim Slade in 15th Di Pasquale in 16th Rick Kelly in 17th Jack LeBrock in 18th Michael Caruso in 19th Davison in 20th Todd Hazelwood in 21st not as great a result, unfortunately, for him. Uh, Tim Blanchard in 22nd, Richie Stanaway in 23rd, Simona in 24th after having an incident with Tim Blanchard, actually, um, where she ran into the wall and lost her entire back end of her car, very similar to what happened to Nick Perkat, um, where he lost the entire right side of his car. She lost the entire back of her car and had to go into the pits and get it all sorted out. Um, James Golding in 25th. He had an awful weekend. His door kept falling open. Um, amazingly and Fabian Coulthard in 26 and I don't even remember why he retired <laughs> which is awful for me um, to not remember why he, didn't, why he didn't make it to the end but he didn't make it to the end um, gosh I don't know I don't know why he didn't make it to the end I don't know why I'm blanking on that oh well that sort of sums up Coulthard's season, I think. Not being anywhere near Scotty, um, unfortunately for him. So, all in all, I think we had a very good season. Uh, in reflection, though, if anyone lost this championship for Shane, it was his team. Um, if you remember, think back to the start of the year, yes, he won the first two races at Adelaide, but after that, it's just all Scott McLaughlin all the way until about June, July, where Red Bull finally get their mojo back and give him cars that can can, can can perform. And I think the only reason why Shane was ahead of Jamie on points for much of the year is, um, well, he won those first two races in Adelaide. That helped a lot. But um, he also, given where they qualified uh, very poorly sometimes outside of the top 10, uh, Shane was more consistently able to fight back through the field to gain, um, to finish in a good spot. So the one lap pace of the Red Bull car simply wasn't there for about half the year. And in a way, it's shocking that Scott didn't run away with the championship sooner considering how many how many runaway weekends he had in that point of the year. Um, so if anyone has lost this championship for Shane, it's definitely been his team. If I had to lay the blame down for anyone as to why uh, Shane didn't win this year it would definitely be Red Bull Uh, they delivered a very subpar car for half the year really Um, and it's only because of the quality of their drivers that they were able to push that car back up to a spot um, 
where they were still in championship contention for much of the year. And also because I think they had a stronger car on race day than, race day than they did on qualifying. But in supercars, track position does count for quite a bit. Um, and unfortunately, they just weren't able to play um, the pit stops to their advantage. Um, except for um, Shane's engineer, whose name I always forget, um, but he did a great job in getting Shane into a position where he was able to fight back through the field. Um, many times where I thought that they'd left him out too long on his tyres. They brought him in and he flew through the field and far exceeded the, the spot where he went in into the pits on. Um, which really is the only reason why Shane did better than Jamie this year is because he had way better comeback drives on strategies like those than Jamie did. Um, but... Honestly, I think Shane drove a really good season in terms of his own um, performance in the car. And really, it's just his own team letting him down at the end there, unfortunately. Hopefully, they come back a bit stronger, though. Um, they've only won eight of the la- They've only won seven of the last eight Constructor Championships Red Bull. So, um, yeah, it's safe to say that they'll be back um, better than ever in the uh, coming year but we'll have to wait and see until 2019 to see how that turns out um let's go over one last time the 2018 virgin australia supercars championship points and in first place after the final race is scott mclaughlin with 3944 points to his name followed by shane van gisbergen 71 points behind uh, close race, but in the end, I think the better man won this year. I think I think the better team won, 100%. Jamie Winkup in third, 511 points back, followed by Craig Lowndes, David Reynolds, Chaz Mostert, Scott Pye, Rick Kelly, and Fabian Coulthard in ninth place, 1,467 less points than his teammate. He finished worse than Rick Kelly and Scott Pye, and I really, really think that says a lot about how Fabian's season has been. The fact that Chaz Mostert, Scott Pye, and Rick Kelly all have more points than Fabian Coulthard when Chaz Mostert's been driving for a team that's been nowhere and has no business being in the top 10 this year. Scott Pye, again, very similar. And yeah, he did win a race this year. But that team has no business being in the top 10 on points. Um, And Rick Kelly, exactly the same thing. Nowhere on points. And I've got to say that all of these people here, Chaz Mostert, Scott Pye, Rick Kelly, and Fabian Coulthard, all won one race each exactly. So they all had that going for them. They all had at least 300 points to their name. And where Fabian has come out worse is that he has been consistently the worst performer when he's not winning. When he's not up the top, he tends to be right down the bottom. And it's shocking because you think... Wow, Chaz Moster and Scott Pye and Rick Kelly, they hadn't had that great of a season. They've often been in 20th place, 15th, not last, but, you know, between the positions of 20 and, and 10th uh, hasn't been uncommon for these guys. But Fabian's done worse than that, and that's really amazes me is he's gone completely under the radar, and he hasn't been able to help Scott at all in the championship is the big thing. Jamie Winkup and even Craig Lowndes have been able to help Shane get more points by simply being in the right place but Fabian Coulthard has not been there when it's mattered Um, and I think that counts for a lot when you're supporting your championship winning teammate anyway that's enough of me bagging on Fabian (laughs) hopefully he comes back next year and he proves me wrong I really would like to see Fabian be at least in championship contention I think he's a good driver when he can be and he has shown a lot of promise I think this year he's been nowhere on pace um, and hopefully um, he can come back next year and completely prove me wrong because that's what I want. I want to see all 26 drivers fighting for the championship, you know, in the end. Um, not just one or two. But anyway, in 10th place, we've got Nick Perkat. He rounds out the top 10, followed by Tim Slade, his teammate in 11th. Very solid season from them. Um, middle of the pack is probably definitely how I would describe their season. Um, Mark Winterbottom in 12th. Um, yeah, I mean, he didn't have the greatest season. We'll see how he does in his new team. Um, hopefully team 18 can 
can really pull something out for Winterbottom because it'd be nice to see him up there again. He's only won one championship despite being constantly ever present at the top of the championship. He's only ever won a single championship and recently too. So um, hopefully they can deliver him a card that uh, is deserving for him. Garth Tanner in 13th. Again, another driver with no business being that high up in the championship. The Gary Rogers car has been nowhere ever since they switched from the Volvo to the Holden um, it's really a shame to see because Gary Rogers has given us some good drivers. I mean, Scott McLaughlin being one of them. Um, before that, Michael Caruso and Lee Holdsworth, who are still on the field today. Garth Tander himself, of course, um, coming from Gary Rogers. It's really a shame to see them down here. I don't think they deserve to be here, but maybe they're just having trouble getting to grips with this um, Red Bull-supplied Commodore. James Courtney in 14th, who that's another name that I've been surprised about. Courtney's been up near the top quite often this year, but hasn't really performed in terms of points. I know a lot of the time he's DNF'd in unfortunate times due to mechanical problems. Um, Baffus being the most notable one. But it's really strange to see him almost, yeah, twice as many positions down from his teammate Scott Pye. And I, if I had to... If, I had to, if someone asked me which one had performed better this season, I would probably say James, but the points say completely different. Um, so, sometimes looking at the points just surprises you. Uh, Will Davison in 15th. Uh, he did really well, actually, you know, considering that he's in the Tickford supplied Ford. Um, better than Cameron Waters, who finished one position below him in 16th. Um... Yeah, Will Davison actually did surprisingly well, and I really hope that Will Davison gets a competitive car because he's a good driver, and I think he can do a lot better than he's been showing. I hate to see drivers like Will and James Courtney and Garth Tanner pottering around the back of the field because they're good drivers and they deserve good cars, but um, at this stage, unfortunately, we're not really getting it for them. So hopefully they come back next year with better cars, better drivers, and are able to challenge for some race wins. That would be fantastic. Uh, Andre Heimgartner in 17th, which I, be I believe is his first season in the Supercars Championship, which would make him the highest-placed rookie. Uh, he, I'm pretty sure he replaced the outgoing Todd Kelly from last year. Um, he did. He's run a, I've been really impressed with his season, to be honest, Heimgartner. He's been up in the top 10 a lot. Um, he's even been, I think, in two top 10 shootouts, including in the one on Sunday, uh, maybe even three. Um he was definitely at the one in New Zealand. And I'm pretty sure he was at one before that as well. Um, I have a lot of I have a lot of uh, hope for Heimgartner in the future. I hope he finds a good drive. And he doesn't languish away in the midfield. Because I think he's got quite a bit of talent. Um, and I hope to see him in a, in a better car in the future. So he can really show that talent. I think he's got a lot to prove. Um, and he's got plenty of talent to do it. Uh, Michael Caruso in 18th, really disappointing to see him so far down um, in that Nissan. He did really well uh, at Winton, but that was kind of it, unfortunately. Um, Jack LeBrock in 19th started out so strong with that top five points finish at uh, Tasmania. Didn't really show anything like that afterwards, but there is flashes of a good driver in there. Again, he's sort of stuck in that Techno car at the moment, which isn't the best car on the field. Um, yeah, Shane used to race for Techno, but that was many years ago. Um, so, now, not so great. Um, it doesn't help that they've got a rookie, a rookie driver in that car, and he can't really help develop the car very well because he doesn't really know much about how the car works at this stage. So someone like Shane being in there on that team is probably no surprise that they were able to uh, bring that car up to a better standard while he was driving for them. But good result from here anyway, because he finished ahead of Anton Di Pasquale, who finished in 20th, who has probably been the most standout rookie of the season in terms of his performances. He's finished really well on some races, and on other races, he's been nowhere, especially when he crashed into Michael Caruso, I think twice in very similar manners in the in uh, two successive races. Um, that was pretty hilarious. Um, as a result, he's got 95 point penalty points to his name for that. And I think it's just silly mistakes from Anton. Uh, he did really well at Bathurst. And he just made some a simple brake lock up into Con Conrad. And that basically put him out of the race. And I was really rooting for him that race as well. Because he was doing so well. 
Um, but unfortunately, just some silly rookie errors put him further back than I think he deserves to be. Again, along with him, uh, him, Jack LeBrock, and Andre Heimgartner, I really do see some decent amount of talent, um, and hopefully that gets honed in for next season, especially since he's at Erebus. Yeah, he finished a long way down the table from David Reynolds, but it's his first year. What can you expect? So I'm hoping that next year, Anton really pulls out something special because I think he's got it in him. And once he's settled in, he should be good to go. But we'll see. I might change my tune Change my tune completely if he hasn't improved much this time next year. Lee Holdsworth in 21st. Um, as we can see from the Newcastle events that he is clearly better than that. Stuck in a poor performing car. And it's good that that question's been answered for me. I was sort of questioning whether or not he was... Really, all that, what all all that he was chalked up to be. Um, I remember him racing for Gary Rogers, and he seemed good then, but maybe he'd sort of faded from him a bit. Um, but clearly, um, these two la- last races at Newcastle have really highlighted to me that he does deserve to be there. He is still pretty good. He just needs a good car to go with him. And I'm not even sure if he's got a drive for next year, so... Hopefully we see him back again because I do like Lee quite a bit and I think he does deserve to be on the grid for sure. It's a shame he's not fighting for race wins again. I would like to see that next year. James Golding in 22nd. Um, James, I mean, he's another rookie uh, racing in a car that, Like I said about Garth, has no business being anywhere near the top 10, and it never really was, and it's no surprise that he's done poorly. It's really hard to judge a guy that hasn't had a chance to shine in anything substantial yet, but he did do really well, I think, at Tasmania. Not Tasmania, uh, New Zealand. Uh, The other Tasmania. (laughs) Um, He did really well at New Zealand, I think. I think he even got a top 10 placement, if I remember correctly. Um, which I was quite impressed with. So again, there's some talent in there, but whether or not it's being completely held back by the car is another story. Um, Simona in 23rd. Another disappointing season for Simona. I like Simona quite a bit, but it's really hard to keep backing her when she doesn't perform at all. And yeah, she's not really... She comes from an open wheel background. And... I think the supercars would be the opposite to open wheel cars. Um, The complete exact opposite of them in terms of how they drive. And she's also driving not one of the best teams um, she's driving for. Um, I do think she's got... I do think she's got some talent. She's got a good head on her shoulders. You could see that from the Newcastle event where she insisted on staying out, not realizing how much damage was on the back of her car and that she did have to go in. Um... But, and there are some occasional flashes of brilliance on that top 10 finish at Newcastle. She did really well to hold on to that instead of just plummeting through the field. And um, uh, qualifying at Darwin, I believe, in in within the top, I think it was 12th or so. Um, she did well there too. But it's just she just hasn't been consistent. And it's very unfortunate because I want to see her doing better. But, yeah... There's not much else I can do about that one. Uh, Tim Blanchard on 24th. Um, I don't know where he's been this year. I really don't. He's just been down the back of the field. Not doing much anything. Same with Richie Stanaway and Todd Hazelwood. But at least in Richie Stanaway and Todd Hazelwood's cases, you can argue Richie Stanaway's a rookie in a car that's terrible. So, of course, he's going to finish down the back of the field. And he also had the worst luck this season I've ever seen. Felt really bad for the guy. I do hope he comes back next year and I do hope he gets a better car with those Mustangs and I do hope that he gets a bit of more of a chance to show what he can do because yeah, he made a few rookie errors when he was up near the front but I don't think he made any more egregious errors than what the other rookies had done. Um, He just had less opportunity to make those errors when he was all the way at the back of the field having scrappy battles with other people. Um, As well as Todd Hazelwood who's Switched their cars halfway through the season. I think he was not a Ford. And now he's in a Holden Commodore VF. Which isn't even the same model as the other Holden Commodore. So um, it's no wonder he's been slow. And he's been nowhere all season. Uh, even when in qualifying times. He's generally been quite a margin away from the rest of the field. Can't really expect much more from that. I'm pretty sure that Matt Stone Racing has come up from Super 2. 
and is attempting um, the, uh, the attempting the big leagues. I don't quite remember off the top of my head, so someone please correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, but uh, that would it'd be a big explanation as for what's happening to him. Uh, I do hope we get to see a little bit more of Todd. Um, he seems like a nice guy, and I do hope that he gets to be a bit more in the spotlight rather than just sort of pottering around at the back of the field like he really has been this year. Um, there's no, there's not really any news because all that happened is that Supercars finished. They had their awards ceremony, all that jazz. But next year, we've got our calendar for next year ready to go. The first race is Adelaide as always. Don't ask me what date it is. I'm not going to do that because I don't think... No, no, I don't want to look it up. I can't be bothered. <laughs> it's not for a while, of course. Um, I might make some content throughout the off-season. Um, just about driver changes. Maybe some tracks. Some top 10 tracks or something like that. Let me know if you'd like to see something in particular. Um, something supercars related. Could be a lot of fun to do stuff like that during the off-season. Um, but in the meantime, this has been the 2018 V8 Supercars Championship. Oh, hold on. Oh, I'm pulling the cord too early. I've got to look at the, the constructors, which no one cares about, but the team championships, I think, are important. So let's talk about that briefly. Well, you know that Red Bull have finished... Um, finished the constructors in first. That means their pit... This, of course... Okay, hold on. I'll rewind a bit. The order that you finish the team championship uh, in supercars nets you the um, different pit bays. So, if you're wondering why DJR Penske was the first pit bay and they had the advantage of looking down the field to see when everybody else had finished fueling their cars, that's because they finished last season in first place in the championship. Uh, so, next season, Red Bull will be in that pit bay because they finished first with a round to spare, followed by DJR Penske, then Tickford, which is the Bottolo Racing and Super Cheap Auto Cars, so that's um, Winterbottom and Chaz Mostert. At the last second, pipping Erebus, who's in fourth, um, which is Reynolds and Pasquale, um, Walkinshaw and Dreddy in fifth, BJR in sixth, uh, Nissan's... Um, Rick Kelly and Andre Heimgartner in 7th. Gary Rogers Motorsport in 8th. Lowndes all by himself in ninth, except he won't be there next year and that team won't be there next year. So that'll probably, that pit bay will be filled by the other Nissan cars of um, Michael Caruso and Simona Di Silvestro in 10th. Um, all the way down the bottom there is Cameron Waters and Richie Stanaway in 11th. Um... Two two car teams having less points than just Lowndes all by himself. Um, in twelfth, Milwaukee Racing, which is twenty three Red Racing, which is uh, Will Davison. I know all the names are confusing, but they tend to go off sponsors for a lot of these names uh, primarily, except for the next one, which is Techno Autosports, which is just Jack LeBrock in thirteenth, Preston Hire in fourteenth. Team Cool Drive in 15th and Big Mate Racing in 16th. Preston Hire being Lee Holdsworth. Cool Drive being Tim Blanchard and Big Mate being Todd Hazelwood. Um, as for the one-car teams, they tend to share a pit bay. Um, I have no idea how they split these pit bays up. <laughs> I really, really don't. Um, if all were fair, um, they would split them up in the order they finished in. But... That's not how it works because the Lounge booth is right behind the Red Bull booth, which I guess is fair enough because it's technically part of the same team, but it's also not because it's separate in the championship. And oh, there's a whole sorts of things about it. Who knows? Who knows? We'll work out the solo teams next year for sure. But in the meantime, with all the championships wrapped up, with I think the deserving team, the deserving man winning the championship this year. I look forward to next year. I look forward to seeing these two incredible drivers battle out again, along with Jamie Winkup and David Reynolds and Chaz Mostert. Mustangs next year. 
I hope the Nissans are better next year. I hope Gary Rogers Motorsports better next year. I hope World Control and Jody's better next year. I basically hope that everybody is a championship contender because that's what I want to see. I want to see close racing every race. I want to see different winners every race. That's what I want. Until next year and until maybe some off-season content that you may see from me, my name has been Kendall. Thank you for listening to my little podcast. Goodbye.